So hi guys, uh, moving on to lecture five, which we'll talk about vesicular bullous disorders. So vesicular bullous disorders, when you are looking at that chapter, it has been divided into two sections. One is the intraepidermal split and the subepidermal split. So when we are looking at a, a bullous disorder, the first thing to decide is whether it's intraepidermal or subepidermal. Once we have decided that it is an intraepidermal split, then is it subcorneal that is just below the stratum corneum? Is it in the spinous layer which is in the middle of the epidermis? Or is it suprabasal? So where the basal layer is, where you can see that the basal layer is still preserved and the split is at the level of the, just above the basal layer, so suprabasal. So based on whether it is subcorneal or intracorneal, whether it is spinous or supra-basal or our differential diagnosis will become different and will also narrow down quite a bit. <clears throat> so let's take the first one where it is an intraepidermal split but at the level of the subcorneum. So just below the stratum corneum. So the first example for this one is this case where we see a two-year-old boy <clears throat> Presenting with fever and diffuse red superficial peeling with perioral furrows. So when we look at the slide that is presented with the case, we can see that the split is at the level of the, so this is the stratum corneum, so it is an intraepidermal subcorneal split. So once you have decided that this is an intraepidermal subcorneal split, your list of differential diagnosis narrows down quite a bit. So what do we see here? We see a few acantholytic cells floating within the layer, within the bulla. So you can see this few acantholytic cells, which are the keratinocytes that have completely split off. But overall, it's a very clean split. There's not too many inflammation here. You don't see any neutrophils. You don't see any eosinophils. So it's a very clean split, actually. So when you see a very clean split, there might be some red cell <coughs> extravasation that you might sometimes see here. You can see some of them here but overall it is a very clean split. <clears throat> so uh, intraepidermal, subcorneal, very clean split, you have to think of. And given the clinical presentation, this is staphylococcal <coughs> scalded skin syndrome. So these patients usually present with fever, diffuse erythema with superficial erosion that are accentuated in the flexural surfaces. <coughs> radial fissuring around the eyes, nose and the mouth and the underlying pathogenesis is the organism Staphylococcus aureus is produces exfoliative toxins which is the endotoxin A and the endotoxin B and they will cleave the desmoglyan 1 and uh, if you remember desmoglyan 1 is more in the superficial part of the epidermis and therefore the split also occurs in the superficial part of the epidermis. Now the differential diagnosis for uh, intraepidermal subcorneal split, the other diagnosis that you need to definitely think of. So the first one was staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome. The other differential is bullous impetigo, <coughs> famphigus foliaceous and famphigus erythromatosis. So famphigus erythromatosis is a localized variant of famphigus foliaceous. So the histology is pre 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 predominantly the same, but this is localized and occurs mostly on the face. So let's look at a case of bullous impetigo. <coughs> so here you can see this flaccid bulla which are usually ruptured at clinical presentation and they're leaving a well demarcated superficial erosion. And when you look at the histology, so again you can see that the level of the split is intraepidermal subcorneal. So you are in that <coughs> differential diagnosis. And this is not a clean split because you see a lot of neutrophils within the Bulla with some acantholytic cells. So you can see the acantholytic keratinocytes and a lot of neutrophils associated with the bulla. And if you do a gram stain, some of these neutrophils might show intracytoplasmic <coughs> cocci, gram positive cocci. So bulla sympatico is intraepidermal subcorneal with admixed acantholytic cells and neutrophils and gram positive cocci. When you look at femphigus foliaceous, this usually presents in the middle aged people with superficial blisters, some with crusted eye erosion. So, and these are all like 
the blisters are gone all you see is the burnt out like the the or the blister is already burst open basically often in a seborrheic distribution which is the scalp the face and the upper chest so what do we see histologically so histologically let's take the epidermis to the top here so again when we look at the bulla it is at the level of the stratum corneum so here you can see the superficial part of the bulla uh, so this is the stratum corneum and then within just below the stratum corneum you can see the split so <clears throat> associated within are a lot of acantholytic cells so these are acantholytic keratinocytes that you see within the bulla so these are broken off keratinocytes so the intercellular bridges are completely broken off and you see this rounded keratinocytes and these are this these are acantholytic keratinocytes in the dermis you see a very superficial perivascular infiltrate there might be some eosinophils but they are not always present but this is a typical presentation for either femphigus foliaceous or femphigus erythromatosus histologically both of them are going to show very similar histology uh, if you do the immunofluorescence you are going to see the chicken wire or the intercellular igg and c3 within the epidermis which is much more predominant in the superficial part and then a weaker in the basal part of the epidermis so given the clinical presentation the histological presentation and then the immunofluorescence you can easily make the diagnosis of femphigus foliaceous or femphigus erythromatosus now we will move on to the next part of intraepidermal split which is the spinous layer so <coughs> so the, this is the the, the lowest more the lowermost layer is the basal layer then you have the stratum spinosum then you have the stratum granulosum and then you have the stratum corneum so when the split is in the level of the stratum spinosum your list of differential diagnoses will include three or four diagnoses that you definitely need to consider this is the first one the patient is presenting with this red fissured plaques in neck area and in the intertigenous areas and when you look at the biopsy here so what we see is a split of the epidermis that is almost like from one end to the other you can see like it's almost encompassing the entire epidermis and that's a very characteristic feature and when you go high power you can see that this is split that is contains a lot of these acantholytic keratinocytes some of them are attached to the upper and the lower layers of the split giving the appearance of a dilapidated brick wall so you can see like this interspinous split sometimes it is even supra basilar and you can come confuse this with femphigus vulgaris but this one if there is the this biopsy doesn't show a hair follicle but if there was a hair follicle present uh heli heli where the, 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 the so the diagnosis here is heli heli disease and heli heli shows this dilapidated brick wall appearance that is throughout the entire epidermis where you can see a lot of these acantholytic cells and if there was a follicle present the follicle is usually not involved in heli heli disease it's involved in femphigus vulgaris it is not involved in heli heli disease that sometimes helps differentiating heli heli from a femphigus vulgaris <coughs> so heli heli the patient present with grouped eroded and clustered vesicles preferentially preferentially in the intertigenous areas and they can become vegetative and malodorous and another thing that you should remember for the board exam is this is caused by mutations in the golgi calcium pump protein which is atp to c1 and after your exams you can control all delete and forget this but till your exams you need to remember uh when you talk about a spinous layer split with acantholysis other especially with acantholysis you have to consider warty disc keratoma grover's disease and darius disease so for warty disc keratoma these usually present as single lesions that could be either that have an umbilicated center even clini clinically also they have an umbilicated center they are most common on the head and neck area so when you look at the biopsy you can see that this is a cup shaped almost like a cup shaped invagination within the epidermis 
this usually on the top has this keratotic plug and then it is like a supra basilar split or it could be at the layer, layer of the spinous layer where you see this villi like structure so these are known as villi where you have the dermal papillae and then you have a basal layer attached so this is almost known like a villi that are protruding into the lacunae so these are known as the lacunae these are known as the villi and then you can see this single acantholytic keratinocytes floating in the bulla actually or in the lacunae. And this is usually associated with the hair follicle. So you have a cup shaped invagination usually associated with the hair follicle that shows the supra basilar split with this villi going into the lacunae and then this floating acantholytic cells. So these are features of a warty dyskeratoma, usually a single lesion. So the clinical presentation is also very important that usually single lesion presenting in the head and neck area. So the next one is Darius. When you talk about the, sorry. Okay, let's go here. So Darius usually present with the same picture that you saw almost in Ilyali, but these are now focal basically. So this is not throughout the epidermis. You can see all these, at, there's a lot of epidermis that is spared and is not involved with the, with the acantholysis. So these are, this is focal acantholysis within the epidermis. Usually it will show this keratotic plug on the top. So this keratotic plug that you see within the acantholysis. And then it's usually either in the spinous layer or suprabasilar. And then when you see this dyskeratotic acantholytic cells, some, some are rounded. These are, you can see this very pink cytoplasm, pycnotic nucleus. So these are known as corp rands. And then the rice grain like ones are known as grains actually. So you have corp rands and grains that are quite common in Darius disease. And this is focal you can see like it stops and goes stops and goes so this is usually focal uh, clinically they present with greasy crusted papules and papulovesicles in the seboric areas and another thing that you need to remember for the board exam is the uh, the mutation involves atp to a2 so atp to a2 you have to remember for the board exams and then when you look at growers growers can present either in like as femfigus like lesions or it can present with darius like lesions but usually these are crusted erythematous papules or papulovesicles and they are usually limited to the upper part of the trunk you know, like they, these lesions do not occur on the extremities so you can see this is focal acantholytic dyskeratosis so it's focal usually you don't see the keratotic plug that you saw in darius and you can see the suprabasilar or intraspinous uh, split with all these single acantholytic keratinocytes within the lacunae. So usually these are single lesions, they are focal, there's acantholysis and there is dyskeratosis and usually occur on the upper part of the trunk. Moving to the intraepidermal supra-basilar split. So here you can see that the split is in the just above the basal layer. So that is a supra-basilar split. So the classic example of an intraepidermal supra-basilar split is femficus vulgaris. Here we have a patient that is usually in the late middle age to late age. They present with this generalized painful erosion usually involving the oral cavity. And then when you look at the split, it is usually intraepidermal supra-basal. So here you can see that the basal layer is still clinging to the dermis and then the epidermis splits above it actually and this is known as the tomb row of tombstones actually so this is very classic the row of tombstones that they talk about in femficus vulgaris because you can if you go hyper you can see like these are individual keratinocytes that are still hanging uh, or sticking to the basal layer so row of tombstones and usually you'll see a superficial perivascular lymphocytic infiltrate and many, most of the times eosinophils, but you do not have to have the eosinophils to make the diagnosis. All you need is this intraepidermal supra-basilar split showing this row of tombstones and it will usually involve the hair follicle. So I don't have a hair follicle here, but in the last picture that we saw, let's go back to the first picture that we saw. So here you can see the classic involvement of the hair follicle 
with the same acanthalysis that happens in femphigus uh, vulgaris actually. So if you do the immunofluorescence, it is going to show you the same pattern that you saw in Fembigus foliaceous, where you will see the intercellular chicken wire pattern uh, that is throughout the epidermis. So these patients usually present flaccid bulla affecting the trunk, groins, axilla, scalp and face. And characteristically, the mucosal involvement in 75 to 90% of the cases actually. And then these, the, the target antigen here is both the desmoglyan 1 and the 3, but more against the desmoglyan 3 actually. So femphigus foliaceus is desmoglyan 1 and femphigus vulgaris is desmoglyan 1 and 3. Other diagnosis to consider when you see the supra-basilar split are paraneoplastic femphigus and femphigus vegetans. So paraneoplastic femphigus is a combination of what you see in femphigus and a little bit of a vacuolar or lichenoid interface changes actually. So usually you'll see a lichenoid or a vacuolar interface change at the dermal epidermal junction that you see here along with changes that you see in femphigus actually. So you will see the supra-basilar or sometimes even intraspinous split within the epidermis. These patients usually are older, they usually have some underlying cancer and clinically they will present with a lot of different kinds of lesions so it's very polymorphous so they could have vesicles they could have bulla they could have targetoid lesions they could have articular lesions they could have papules so it's almost like an overlap between erythema multiforme and femphigus vulgaris or sometimes bullous femphigus and or lichen planus so there's almost like a combination of multiple diseases but the classic lesion is this hemorrhagic mucosal lesion actually that you see here and these are usually associated with some underlying malignancy. So they might have some sort of an underlying lymphoma, they might have Castleman's disease. And when you look at the serology, when, when they do the studies, there's, there, there's a lot of antibodies that are involved in paraneoplastic femphigus. And the last diagnosis in this chapter is femphigus vegetans. So femphigus vegetans classically will again show the changes that you saw in femphigus where you see the intraepidermal supra-basilar split. But the characteristic feature that you see in femphigus vegetans is usually the presence of the eosinophilic intra uh, micro abscesses within the epidermis. So this is a very classic feature that you're going to see in femphigus uh, vegetans where you see a lot of intraepidermal eosinophilic micro abscesses. And intraepidermal eosinophilic microabscesses are not very commonly seen. They will be seen in femphigus vegetans. And the other diagnosis that you need to consider is incontinentia pigmenti. Uh, but incontinentia pigmenti, the clinical presentation is different. <clears throat> and then if you don't have the clinical presentation, the other feature that you normally see is a lot of dyskeratosis within the epidermis. Here we don't see the dyskeratosis, but we see the split here. So you can see the intraepidermal supra-basilar split with eosinophilic microabscesses, which is a classic feature for femphigus vegetans. And clinically, they will present, present with vegetating lesions, usually in the intertriginous areas. So I think that's the end of the chapter. The paraneoplastic femphigus, we already talked about the lymphomas and the Castleman disease. And uh, one thing, if you do the immunofluorescence in paraneoplastic femphigus, it is going to show you the intercellular pattern of femphigus vulgaris. But it may, it may or may not show you a linear deposition of IgG and C3 at the dermal epidermal junction. So you might see a combination of both femphigus vulgaris and bullous femphigoid, like pattern in paraneoplastic femphigus. And... Uh, <clears throat> If you want any additional in-depth information about any of these diagnoses, you want to see more clinical images, you want to see more digital slides, go to publications.pathpresenter.net. Uh, look at this. Uh, there's a book, Dermatopathology for Residents, written by around 65 well-known authors. Uh, you can, it's a free resource. You just go into it and you can have a look in the, all the differential diagnoses. Thank you very much. Uh, if you, I hope you enjoyed the talk and the next talk with for the subepidermal split we'll do another lecture that will be lecture number six thank you